everybody this is Maureen and this is the video you've been waiting for I wanted to show you the 1928 singer that I happened to just recently procure over the New Year's holiday and since I'm down here in my normal sewing location I wanted to kind of show a little bit of my library and a few other things so this might be a little longer video than what you're used to so be warned First off, um, this particular, and I'm just gonna move here, squeaky chair. This particular item that we have here with the sewing machine, I had the table for many, many years, over a decade. And with that, I always kept a machine on top of it. I didn't have an older machine that fit inside of it. This is probably from the 1970s. It's the sewing table that my mother had given to me when I moved out and started doing housekeeping. So I have some of some items in there. You can keep spools of thread. There's little tabs in there. This is meant to actually accommodate an electric machine. Oh, oh there we go. And that's our wonderful furnace turning on. So hopefully you can hear me over this. But what I wanted was a machine that didn't run on electricity at all. Um, since I do sewing that's of the 16th century, I wanted something or to, to try a machine that was a treadle machine. Because if you think about it, it's not all that far off from a spinning wheel, which is 13th century technology that was used to spin thread, spin wool and linen or flax fibers into thread. So this is kind of taking that thread punching it through material and making a garment out of it or at least finishing edges and things of this nature so this machine I happened to come by at a local antique shop and so many of these I'd either find in very poor condition where they're really rusty like the this plate or the face plate would be rusted beyond belief this is actually in really good shape. There's little bits, tiny ones here and there. But I happen to also go over to a local sewing machine shop and got some great advice on cleaning this up and getting it ready to use. So as you can see, the paint is in really good shape and I went ahead and cleaned, cleaned it up. I didn't go too crazy on the metal parts at this point in time. But I mean, you've got your little thread bobbin down there and you can even lift it up to change your bobbin. There's oily oil points all over the machine to be able to oil it properly. So that's been kind of interesting, reading up about the machine and learning how it's meant to function. And then the paint was in pretty good shape to start with. I was able to find, there's some dings in the enamel that I was able to kind of just seal over. But for the most part, I mean, this is in great shape. I was able to find out the year by using the manufacturing number right here. I was able to find out more about the machine itself. Now this one didn't have an electric motor, it didn't have a light or any of the other accessories, so it was really just a straight machine. Of all places, sitting on the floor and didn't have any sort of other items with it, but it was in such great shape. And I, when I got this, I checked to make sure that this spun and that moved, which it, it does most beautifully. I later was able to buy this piece, which there's an accessories boss underneath here, where they've molded the metal out to hold a boss like this for the hand crank, which is what this is, which allows you to go at a much faster rate. And for the most part, I have to say it's a fairly quiet machine. Even going at a faster pace. Now I did just recently oil the machine, so I'm actually surprised considering it's a treadle, how quiet it is. And I happened to ask the experts at my local Singer sewing machine repair shop 
well, are these noisy or are they quiet? And they told me it varies on the machine. You can have a machine in perfectly fine shape and it clanks a little bit. And they've, you know, checked all over to make sure that everything's functioning properly and things aren't bumping against each other. And that machine just happens to clank. A friend might have the exact same model may even be the same year and it's quiet as all get out so this one is fairly quiet and luckily this sewing table i mean it even has a little measuring bit on here i'll have to see how accurate this is but i mean it's it's not been scratched up this part of the table i've really not used very much as you can tell what i've been doing because the machine does not sit down into the table uh, that's how you take the machine out of the table is by laying it down. This won't hold the machine. There are some tables that do hold the machine. They're normally meant to store the treadle machine when it's not being used. And we'll instead having a, of the hand crank here, it'll have a device on the floor with a, a treadle to operate the machine with a belt that normally would come up through the table and it hooks. If you had a belt for the machine, it would actually hook right here. So, but I have to say I'm very, whoop, very pleased with how it looks. Here's the back side of the machine. And yet again, the paint's in really great shape. And I was really thrilled that I have quite a few of the attachments to this as well. And I happened to locate this at my local Joann's and I said, okay, this is how I'm going to store all of the items for my sewing machine. So it's a, just a general sewing box, but I put all my tools in here. So I have several different feet in here that go with this machine. These are all Singer feet. And one of the ones that I've gotten to see in use by other seamstresses on Coztube is one of these ruffler feet, which I'm really looking forward to getting to use because I am not very good at a rolled hem. And the, the this rolled hem actually, rolled hem foot, I'm excited to try. Because by hand, I'm not good at it. Though, the rough, this is the ruffler foot. And the ruffler foot is kind of interesting because it will do gathers for you. And you can even set the depth of your gathers as well on that. So some very interesting feet and extensions. And there's one here that, I think this is a different kind of gathering foot. Might even be a hemming foot, I think is what I remember this one. Yeah, because of the measuring device. This one's a hemming foot. And I mean, you even just have your basic. This is the one that came on the machine. It has a little rust on it, so I'm going to take some steel wool to it and uh, some oil and get that all cleaned up. So I put this one on the machine for now, which functions just beautifully. Believe it or not, I was really surprised because I have more than one of the rolled hem, which is fine because I'm sure they come in handy one way or the other. Yeah, there's this one, and then I have this one. Ah, they're two different sizes. Look at that. This one is smaller than this one. So I have two different kinds of rolled hem feet. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit better, actually. So besides the feet, I have your typical measuring devices and a little bit of the touch-up paint if I should accidentally chip the enamel. It would take something pretty pretty rough to chip the enamel on this, but I have that there as a just in case. So we have um, a selection of brushes to clean with. We've got 
Um, several other kinds of little tools in here. Some extra belts, which there are belts in certain areas that, that you might possibly need. Like this one, it's for the bobbin winder. That one I had to put on because the old one had turned into some very scary looking, I don't know what kind of material. Old rubber turns dry and crusty over time. I put all of my sewing machine needles in one spot. That was a problem of mine. Normally they would end up God knows where. And I'd always be hunting for sewing machine needles. So if I find any more in my travels in my sewing area down here, well, now I will add them to the box. One of the other things that I found wonderfully useful is I had gotten several more of the bobbins. The metal ones are the ones to use for the machine. I was told you could technically use plastic ones, but the advice I had received was that you're better off using the metal ones since the machine was originally started or originally had metal ones. And then I happened to get these two guides online. These are sort of reprints of the originals and they're fantastic. I mean, it goes over how to deal with the tension, doing basting stitches, how to change things on the machine, how to use the hemming and sewing of, of lace, all sorts of wonderful things in the book. And I have a very curious cat who is, you know, all excited for me, I guess. So I have those obviously in here because you want to keep your manuals nearby. And they were probably in the less than $20 range. It was a little more than what I'd want to pay for a paper instructional manual. But because of getting my Singer, I really needed something. So I just put this down here and this right here. The sewing machine oil, which that is Singer sewing machine oil, kind of fits right here where the opening is. Let me just close that up. Ta-da. So everything's in one spot. And just for interest, vintage irons with vintage trivets with my historical doll books because that's how we roll here. And my wonderful Singer sewing machine. And we have these little bits of, of dust. I made, and I'm gonna show you how this fits over. I made a cover and I'm still working on parts of it at this point in time, but the cover fits over the machine, except for the very tip of the handle. So I mean, Excuse my reach, because I'm having to kind of do this partially one-handed. It even fits over the extension, because this does make the machine longer when you add the handle extension to it. And I found this vintage fabric also at Joann's, which is a Simplicity, the company that makes the patterns. Happen to also have vintage sewing, a couple of different ones. And this one had the machines on it with all sorts of other sewing accoutrements. And I'm like, that's what I will make my sewing machine cover from. So I have, I'm using this as a little handle, this frog. And I have a whole bunch of other ones that I'm gonna kind of put around the edge to keep the pocket from being flappy like this. But also it'll allow me to kind of open and close and get things in there without it moving around too much. So that's how it, it fits at this point in, in time. It still protects it for the most part and the cats normally leave the machine alone. The only reason Jace is kind of exploring around is because I'm down here right now, which is, is the normal. You know how cats are. They love to be wherever you are. Right, Jace? So besides the machine, and the box full of the supplies, and a wee bit of the library. I have actually quite a bit more books. Uh, particularly over here, we have some knitting books and some more of those paper-covered kind of instructional books. A lot of them 
are, let's see, oh, quite a few are the Complete Anachronist, which is a publication that SCA prints. And they've, since the SCA has been around for many, many years, there's actually several different editions of the Complete Anachronist. Um, I have one in regards to medieval adhesives, doing embroidered jackets, as well as, let's see, one in regards to being a consort and about the Tudor and Elizabethan household. And they publish these every so often. They're very handy and well-researched. I highly recommend it. You can find the complete anachronist at sca.org underneath their publications. And down here, we have a few other odds and ends, a um, couple illumination books. There's an encyclopedia on herbs. Um, I love books and they are truly a utilitarian item. They look beautiful most of the time, depending on how well they're treated. And information is just gold, to be honest. And it's wonderful to have what you need on hand for the information you're looking up. Right here, I kind of have a tin box that I happen to locate. I have some of my silk threads up here trying to keep them away from the cat. And um, I have jars of miscellaneous sort of herbs and things around the the sewing area. Not everything has its home just yet. It's a constant work in progress. A whole cake of beeswax. Unfortunately, cats, having them about, they broke a teacup that was full of beeswax, and that's why that's there. So, But we do have our fuzzy felted friends every once in a great while. This is another shelf that kind of has a mix here. We have a historical craft book. We have a few books with sonnets and poems. A book on embroidery and stump work. Um, an 18th century clothing at Williamsburg book, which is always interesting. Pens and needles, a very interesting kind of idea about sewing and the impact that women have in regards to that medium. Very good book if you can get, get a hold of it. The video is not sponsored, but uh, you, I always like to give a good recommendation here and there. This is basically a homemade by me item to basically sort out flax fibers as you comb them through and get rid of the rougher ones and you, it gets more and more fine. I think they call it a hetchel, actually, is the, the name of this. This is my sort of at-home version. I haven't gotten to test it out yet, but there's always more time to do that later. On this shelf, we have um, a couple other plant books, a plant craft and Native American wild plants book. This one is in regards to color and design. Weaver's Garden, which is about plants for making fibers. A Victorian household traditional book of useful information and skills one should know, which is quite handy. And then Home Comforts, which is very simple, uh, similar about keeping house. Because it's good to know, since sewing is definitely an art more than a science, it's good to also know the other things that are within the realm of household items. Oh, there goes the, the heater again. I'm drying some flowers, so there's that. And over beyond the sewing machine, I have my thread keep, some storage, and then more wonderful books. So I have some other doll books that couldn't fit on the other shelf. So we have them over here, miniature embroidery. We have several books of hours or printed books of hours um, for inspiration really because some of the patterns in the books of hours you can do in embroidery as well as other forms of illumination there's this good housekeeping needle craft encyclopedia i love these these are great when you can run into original texts with suggestions and projects 
They might be old, they may be a little bit abused, but if you can get a hold of them, they are great resources to see what the thought and interest was at the time. Another book on weaving. And then I have several other small books. These thin ones are ones published by the SCA, which they have the complete anachronist, as I had mentioned, but then you also can get these larger ones, which sometimes are kingdom, kingdom related kinds of situations. Oh, the Estelle, this one, these are old copies of the Estelle when they still printed them. And there are sometimes articles put in them as well. A lot of the um, kingdom newsletters have been put online now instead of having the paper version. So I have a few of the old ones of that. There are more embroidery books, all, all the embroidery books, well, at least a large majority of them. Specifically in regards to Tudor and Elizabethan embroidery is what I look for. And this one's about needlepoint, which is also based on that time frame. These are little taller ones. They're all stump work books. And they're all by Jane Nicholas. She's highly recommend her series of, of embroidery books. They're really great. A book on medieval brasses, a book on the cloisters. Uh, this one's on tapestries. It's unfortunately a little, little long for this bookshelf. And then pretty much from there over is all books about lace and lace making and the different forms of lace making. And this one on Forgotten Crafts actually has several different kinds of crafts in it. It's good to have those generalized volumes that tell you about several different crafts all at the same time. What helps with that is that you can then take that look at the resources that they use for that topic and be able to then find other books on the topic that are more specific. Let's see here. Let me move these baskets. So this is a V&A publication. Oh, in regards to velvet. Okay. This book's in French in regards to Tudor costume in the French court. And let's see, Modern Maker, which would be a book okay doing couture sewing historical wig styling period costumes and then I have some historic underclothing books and a few other ones that don't fit in my upstairs library a few about jewelry some about more needlework from Mary Queen of Scots which those are really good books if you're looking at late embroidery from the 16th century. And then this just happens to be miscellaneous supplies, some thread, and uh, lots of scissors. I mean, most of those are on the end. So it's sort of my general catch-all for whatever can't fit into the sewing machine box. If it isn't machine related, it's normally over here. And I have my hand sewing embroidery kit upstairs, which is an early, er, earlier video of mine in regards to historical hand sewing. So if you're interested in that, that's there. And then a whole bunch of embroidery hoops. Now I know that everybody's thinking, this is a basement. This is probably not the best place to store a lot of these things. This is a basement that doesn't really have an outside entrance. It's warm and it's dry. And it's a finished basement. I mean, I have a cement floor down here. So it, there is a little bit of dampness that I do have to worry about. But for the most part, I can be down here for hours with just like a, a sweater and be comfortable. And then I kind of have the rest of my storage over here, various different fabrics, my, my other sewing box. I have a couple of them because I have my sewing place down here and then I also sew upstairs for like doing hand sewing. Sometimes the lighting's a little bit better. I'm hoping to figure out a better lighting situation down here as well. But I wanted to at least show you the 1923 singer that I was able to get a hold of. 
if you have any other questions or know more about these kinds of sewing machines, I'd really appreciate any information that you can provide or interesting questions. Please leave them in the comments and please keep an eye on the channel. There's always going to be at least a video a week in regards to different vintage sewing topics and historical sewing. Thanks for watching. Bye.